Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 18, 2018. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. A little housekeeping. Let me know if you're watching the recording of this and you had trouble getting into the live show. We're trying to figure out what's going on there. All right, what do we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. In fact, that's pretty much going to be the show. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them to the slides while we're on the slides, but towards the end of the slides, and I'll let you know when that is, or when we open it up for stock picks, when we get to the live charts, feel free to ask about anything you want. And if I can't cover it in this session, I'll cover it in either a week of charts or a Q&A session. So let's get back to the charts, and I want to talk about, I do a recap on Dave Light, bear market update, or a potential bear market update, et cetera. And there's quite a few things I want to talk about, so there's no need to tell you what I'm going to talk about. Let's just dive right in. There was a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I have to say, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, back in, uh, I guess it was April, I was doing a series on winter is coming, and that bastard John Snow, that's what he's often saying, that winter is coming. And now beginning to wonder once again, based on conditions in the market. So I want to revisit some of those things we talked about back in April, and I want to add in some newer research to that and talk about some of the things we talked about last week. Now, as I often preach, all major tops or bottoms, and all being a key word in that sentence, will have a transitional pattern, a bow tie, a first thrust, or something along those lines. So every top will have a sell signal. Maybe you might want to write that down. The caveat, though, is, and obviously, not every sell signal will turn up to a major top. Now, you've seen this slide quite a bit. And this is just going back to April. And if you look back to 99 and 2000, the top of 2000, the bottom of 2002, 2003, top of 2007, 2008, and, of course, the bottom in 2009. And by major buy or sell, we're looking at bow ties in this particular case meaning that the 10-period simple has crossed below the 20-period exponential, and the 20-period exponential has crossed below the 30-period exponential, and it gives the appearance of the bow tie. And we're going to show you a zoomed-in. I guess it's going to be just me here. <laughs> so I will show you a zoomed-in picture of some of these things so it'll make more sense. Anyway, we did have a major sell, major meaning that we're coming off of major highs or all-time highs, or for buys would be major lows, and obviously we don't want to go to an all-time low in the market. We'd have a lot more problems, but major lows are, let's say, five-year lows, 10-year lows, or more. One thing that I have found, and I talk about this quite often, is that if you just sort of trade on the fringes with these transitional setups, with these emerging trend setups, you could do really well because you get into a new trend really early. Now, unfortunately, you will be wrong, and that comes with the territory quite a bit, but when you're right, you're going to be right very, 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 very big. Now, going back to 2015, 2016, we did have a sell signal on the weekly. Now, the market didn't really sell off that hard, but what was pretty amazing back then was if you take a look at a weekly Russell 2000, as I've said quite a bit, and again, we're looking for a major signal off of all-time highs, okay, and then we're looking for the bow tie. Now, in this particular case, it looks like a bow tie. You can see the moving averages have come together and spread out fairly cleanly, and we'll talk about a sloppy bow tie here in a little while, and you can see that the market bases the Russell 2000 from the trigger dropped about 18%. So that's nothing to sneeze at. 
the media, for what it's worth, calls the bear market as a 20% or more drop. So for all intents and purposes, at least by the media's definition, there was a bear market in the Russell 2000, or close enough for government work, from a weekly bow tie. So the point I'm trying to make here is when you get a major sell signal like this, pay attention. Now, where are we now? Well, it's not too bad on a weekly basis if we take a look at these moving averages. So this is a weekly chart. So the 10 period would be 10 week. The 20 period obviously would be 20 weeks and then 30 would be 30. But you can see that these moving averages have moved down. You can see that it was getting kind of ugly in here back in April when I did this last presentation similar to this one. But we did not get a crossover to the downside. Now, again, we did have this crossover back in 2016 and the market sold off fairly hard from that i don't have the whole chart in here so you can't see the whole picture but the point is again you want to make sure you pay attention when you have these major sell signals now last week and prior to that i talked about the tfm 10 percent system i'm not going to go into a lot of details because i did cover this in details both last week and I covered it in a lot of detail under the members area. And I'll show you where that is towards the end of the presentation. The point I was making here is that if a market is going to drop, let's say, 50%, it's going to drop 10% first. Conversely, if a market's going to rally 50%, it's going to rally 10% first. Now, there's a few caveats mixed in. But that's pretty much the basis of the system. If the market's going to go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's going to have to pass through, through B along the way. Now, basically, I was just saying that, OK, as long as we're within 10 percent of all time highs. So let's say the market's at A. or Let's just say we have A, we have B and we have C. Well, C's new highs. OK. And B is somewhere in between, obviously, A and C. So as long as we're near C, we want to stay long. If we are approaching B, coming back down, then we want to A, get out of the way, or B, possibly even, or should I say and, possibly even put some shorts on. So you can see that we were below 10% as far as the distance between B and C. So B is like in this particular case was up here near C. And you can see that this ribbon down here stayed bullish. OK, well, I have this programmed in. If you have Metastock, I'll give you this. And some of these indicators are already in the, the um, actual Metastock straight from the factory. But as long as you have Dave light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, see this low here. Here's a moving average. So this is greater than this. OK. And as long as you are within, or no more than, I should say, 10% away from all-time highs, you want to stay long. And actually, I say all-time highs. I think I programmed the system for 200 and I think it was like 50-week highs or something along those lines. I don't remember exactly. And it's it doesn't really matter the details. Just know that. You could pick whatever parameters you want, but I think I use, when developing the system, I think I use 50-week highs. And the reason I did that was so when you were down in a bear market and it was time to get long, the system would get you long once again. But the beauty of this is that once the market goes greater than 10% away from all-time highs, and this is just a little whipsaw filter. It closes below the 50 SMA. So in this case, it'd be the 50 week SMA. And you can see right here, we close below. Then you want to exit or possibly go short. And notice that our band down here, our ribbon, I should say, turned bearish in this particular case. So where are we now? Well, it did go 
slightly bearish in the aforementioned period and 2016, okay, 2015, 2016, and then it turned bullish again. It had a few neutral periods. So neutral period means that it's either below the moving average or below 10% from C, okay, but not both. And once the lows get greater than the moving average, in other words, you have Dave Light, and it's less than 10% away from its highs, then this ribbon turns bullish. And you can see it stayed bullish for a long, long time. Now, what happened back in April when I was beginning to get a little bit worried? Well, I'm glad you asked. Notice that it came down and tagged that 50-day moving average. So that got rid of Dave Light. It became dangerously close to that 10% number, okay? So you didn't have both, so this stayed, this I should say, turned neutral for a little while, and then we turned back bullish. Now, last week, we tagged that 50-day moving average and closed above it, and we're also below 10%. We're less than 10%, believe it or not. It feels a lot worse, though, doesn't it? We're less than 10% away from all-time highs. So we're still sort of in a longer-term bullish mode, Bear, uh, bull market, hope for less than a Freudian slip. And notice that we went from neutral back to green. Well, let's not start kissing each other just yet. But if you are focusing on the long, long, long term, so far, the market is still okay. Now, as I often preach, you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light, just like you can't have a bear market without a sell signal. You can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. Now, I've showed this chart quite a bit. I've updated it as of this morning. And you could see using a 50-week moving average, as long as the lows are greater than the moving average, meaning you have upside Dave light, it's green. And as long as the highs are less than the moving average, you have downside Dave Light, and it's red. And notice that would have kept you on the right side of every bull and bear market. And I just went back to 1995, but you could go back. I've In the past, I've gone out back throughout history, and it's pretty amazing. Same thing with the 10% system, the TFM 10% system. It's pretty amazing. Would have got you out before the Depression, would have got you out on the Friday before the crash in 87, would have gotten you out in obviously 2000 and in 2007, 2008. Now, if you squint your eyes, you will see that in some of these bull runs in here, there have been a tiny, 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 tiny bit of red, but for the most part, it stayed green. Now you can see there's that, well, that's not the uh, 2011. It's way back in 2000. I'm sorry. That's, I was thinking it was 2016. I'm getting ahead of myself. But way back in 2011, it did turn red, meaning that the price was below the 50-day moving average, and that did not materialize into anything. But sometimes you have to get out of the way when that occurs. And then the good news is if you get out the way, you're, it's called a whipsaw. And as Greg Morris says, Bear markets are devastating. Whipsaws are frustrating. Whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration. And I'll have another quote from the clan that Greg Morris used to work with over there at uh, Stadium Capital Management along the lines of getting out of the way. Anyway, the point is, if you get out the way, even if you have to get back in, you still have the potential to capture a longer term trend should it ensue. And if it turns into a bear market, you avoid the whole bear market and you're in a beautiful position to get back in when the market turns back up. So the point is, market timing is much better than buy and hold. 
and I don't want to go off on that tangent because I think everybody here is a believer. But if you're not, trust me, it is. Go through the first few free videos on the member section, and I'll make that case. And a lot of that research does come from Greg. Now, you can see in 2016, that period we talked about a little bit, There's that's what I was talking about. Notice that we did have some red with a little green interspersed in between. And that was a time to be prudent, okay? You didn't necessarily want to go crazy bearish, but you certainly wanted to get out of the way, honor your stops, etc. By the way, the model portfolio is 100% in cash right now for those keeping score. And some of you were kind enough to email me to thank me for that. It's like, well, we're just following along and we're using stops. So, and this was... Um, right before the market got into a pretty serious slide. It's better to be on the dock wishing you were out to sea, as I can attest to as someone who's nearly sank many times offshore, well, at least once. <laughs> got caught in a low pressure system once too in a little bitty boat. That wasn't much fun either. And I've had some other pretty ugly experiences, but better to be on the dock wishing you were out to sea than out to sea wishing you were on a dock. Anyway, before I digress, too far, this last little run we've had since 2016 has been a pretty good little run. As I've pointed out in the past, when you get about 100 days above, and here's 100 right here. I don't know if you can see it on your screen. But when you get about 100 days or so above that moving average, you usually have a correction back down to the moving average. Sometimes that correction can be the start of something much bigger. Sometimes it's just a correction. So you can see that the period we're in now looks a little bit like, let me just redraw that. The period we're in now kind of resembles the period that we saw in 2015 where the market got a little bit ahead of itself, came back in and corrected. So this is where we are now, obviously. Let's zoom in on that. And you could see that we got way up here close to 100. Not that you want to necessarily sell the market when it's way up here, but when you when it's getting there, getting higher and higher and higher, okay? Now, this is just a number count. So this is not a magnitude. This does not measure how far away you are. It just measures how many days. So day one would be right here, and here's day one here. Day one, day two, day three, day four. So as long as it stays above and doesn't intersect the moving average, this will go up, okay? And again, so it's not magnitude. So notice you came dangerously close to that moving average right here and right here, but it still counts as another day, another day, another day, or in this case, a week above the moving average. So notice that the highs, the numbers, I'm sorry, the number of lows greater than the moving average or day like the change to grow. When it intersects, the count starts over. Okay, it takes a nosedive down to zero. And now we begin to climb our way out. And then what happened recently? Bam, we go back to zero Dave light. And it looks like we might have one bar above the 50 week moving average. So here's a longer term way of looking at the market using either Dave light on a weekly basis or the 10% system on a weekly basis. And granted, you will have some fairly big spills in between, but for the most part, it will keep you on the right side of the market. Now, by those spills, I mean lag, okay? All systems have lag. All systems will have whipsaws. It just comes with the territory. Again, as I often preach, if I eliminate those things, you'd never see my fat arse again. The other thing that if I could eliminate without digressing too far, as one of you clients recently pointed out, but it's like, boy, that momentum gets ugly in the end. It's like, yes, it does. These fantastic momentum stocks that just go straight up, when it ends, it ends badly. If I could figure out how to solve where that end, ends badly, then you'd never see my fire hours again. But we use money management, take partial profits, and use stops to get us out if it's only a small gain and hopefully keep us in for the majority of the large gain should it ensue. 
Now, notice here, again, we had two little kisses of that moving average. And notice that, again, that this, and I might have a, a notice that this, oh, that's, that this is not a, a this is my, my cursor. Notice that the count of Dave light resets itself when you get a little kiss. Now, one thing I talked about the last time I gave this presentation is that tops are often a process versus an event. We all think of like, oh my God, the market crashed, the bear market, it's horrible. Oh, oh, it's just, it's just horrible, horrible, horrible. Well, usually, and usually is a key word in that sentence, but usually a top is more of a process than it is an event. And if you go back to 2008, and it always amazes me when I, when I read about it now or if I hear about it on TV, how it, 2008 caught everyone off guard. And it's like, well, I don't understand that because I'm not being flippant. It's like I started getting sell signals. I started getting short setting up. I could not find a long to save my life by being a trend following moron. I'm not, you know, quite the contrary. I'm not saying that I'm some genius. You know, I saw some guy the other day advertising, trying to sell you his BS system, said he was a Mensa. It's like, well, I don't know about that. I think you'd be better off being a trend following moron. But I digress. Anyway, the point is 2008 was such a process. It was a beautiful process from an antiseptic kind of like looking at it from a pure standpoint as a technician, technical analyst. Not that I was glad it rolled over, but it was like it was kind of a fun thing at the time. Like, wow, OK, we're getting knocked out of our longs. That's not much fun. But, hey, we're getting some shorts. They're beginning to work. We're not getting rich. But you know what? We're making money while everybody's going absolutely bonkers. Anyway, the point is process versus event. As I often say, or have said many times before, when I joined the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, I thought I'd learn all these GUS things. And I learned a few things that were kind of GUS. But for the most part, I learned and relearned a lot of simple concepts. And that's actually worth probably a lot more than that GUS stuff, such as a top is usually a process versus an event. And a bottom, believe it or not, is usually an event or often an event versus a process. Now, 2002, 2003 bottom, to me, that seemed like a big process. But if you go back and look at a lot of other bottoms in the market, especially like 2009, when it just starts imploding and then all of a sudden it makes that spike rebound right back up. Anyway, long with it say uh, way of saying is, are we in this big longer term process? Now, if we take a look at the moving averages, one thing that people often worry about is the death cross. Well, the death cross, meaning the 50 day moving average crossing below the 200 day moving average you need to pay attention to it. And if you, I think it's the golden cross when it comes back up. If you were to trade that system in and of itself, you probably wouldn't do too good, okay? I think my friend Rob Hanna, who does a lot of mechanical testing, I think he, he I think the edge is like 4% or something. It's like a very small, small edge. But what I did a while back, a few years ago, when we had a death cross and everybody was had their panties in a wad, is I went in and did the research, and like any other cell signal, it's the magnitude of the cell signal that's important and not the signal in and of itself, okay? Let me explain what I'm saying. Let's say, let's just imagine that we have a death cross in here, and the market goes, let's say the market implodes 50%. Well, by the time you get a cell signal, it might already be back up, 80% or whatever, and then you get that, I'm sorry, by the time you get a buy signal, well, it's not the crossover to crossover that's relative, it's the magnitude of what happens in between, okay? 
So if we did have a death cross in here, then I would obviously it'd be one more piece of the puzzle to be worried about. But the thing is, don't trade it in and of itself, but be warned that the magnitude, the drop that the market could drop below or, or from afterwards, I should say, let me rewind that. The amount that a market can drop after a sell signal like this or any other sell signal for that matter can be very significant. So if you were using a trailing stop or some money management, and yeah, that market dropped 50% before it came back to only be down, let's say, 5% 10 years from now or 5 years from now or 25 years from now. Instead of looking at that, well, it was a 5% move, the reality is like, no, you lost over half of your money. But if you were short, you could have trailed the stop lower. So the magnitude after these signals is important. Now, getting back to the death cross, right now you can see that the 50 has begun to turn down a little bit in here. And as I discussed back in April, what's an interesting phenomenon is with moving average you have moving averages you have a drop off effect when you're adding in lower prices and dropping off higher prices even if the price is moving higher okay and i'll show you that in just one second in fact let me just draw that in so you can see it the moving average will continue to head lower so let's say tomorrow we close right here today we close right here for argument's sake well, if you go back 50 days, which is right in here somewhere, you would drop off this price and then you would add in this price to the moving average. So that would keep that moving average trending lower. OK, now it's kind of like, well, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. Everybody knows that. Well, what's interesting is as I'm putting this presentation together years and years ago, I used to work with a hedge fund and we looked at the 30 day moving average. And part of my job was to make predictions of where that 30-day moving average would be based on the dropout off effect. And I would just calculate it out in a spreadsheet. And uh, a lot of times I just eyeball it and just to know whether it was trending lower or higher. Believe it or not, where that 30-day moving average was did have an impact on things. Without digressing too far, it was important to the hedge fund manager as to where it was. And he was fully aware of the drop-off effect. He didn't care about it, but my job amongst other things as his technician was to, was to analyze that drop-off effect for him. So it is important, even though it's kind of like a, a false type of thing if you think about it, because that moving average is headed lower, even though price could actually be headed higher, at least shorter term. Now we're gonna have a very interesting phenomena here because what's going to happen is we're going to have that drop off effect for a while. As you can see, we're still going to be higher prices coming off and generally lower prices coming in. But what's going to happen is we're actually going to start adding in higher prices. And it's actually going to be it's actually quite interesting for a while where this average could actually come up a little bit before it goes down. Now, I'm, I'm thinking way too far ahead and maybe I shouldn't even brought that up. But for now, we are dropping off generally higher prices and we're adding in generally lower prices. But what's going to happen again, we will add some higher prices in. So it could this moving average could flatten out a little bit. Oops, could flatten out a little bit. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is that death cross could be delayed for a while while the moving averages catch up because you still got some higher prices coming in that will be added back into price, okay? So hopefully that made sense. Now, when I was looking back to the presentation I did back in April, I pointed out that we were in no man's land. And at the time, I believe I gave credit to Gary Kalpon for saying that. So this morning I'm like, well, you big dummy, just email Gary and say, hey, Gary, uh, was it you that said this? Because it sounds like something you would say. And he's like, yeah, it was me. And I'm like, can you flesh it out a little further? He goes, yeah, sure. And Gary said, he said this morning in an email, it goes like this. Nothing good can happen trading below the 50-day, but nothing bad can happen trading above the 200-day. Trading between is no man's land where 
One just waits to see what is decided, a break below or a break above. If it's only a correction, the best stocks will find lows in between, rally up first, build handles or flat bases and break out first. Currently, notice where the big four, the NASDAQ, the index, the S&P and the Dow held this week, right around the 200 day. And we're going to pick that apart in a little while. The boys know the fact it has held a few times this year. If it breaks, I expect a waterfall. Hope, is, hope all is well. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate that. So his point is that, and this was what he was saying back in April, was that we're in no man's land. And then once again, we're back in no man's land where if you think about it, markets do tend to futz around and chop around quite a bit when you get in between those two moving averages. So you can see what happened last time. And you can see what happened again. And then his point is obviously if you break below, it starts getting ugly. And if you go above, everything is okay. At least the base is that. And last time this happened, back in what, April? It fussed around for a little while. The market found its way. And which way did it end up finding? It found its way higher, okay? But now we have, or now we're back in what the, uh, getting back to the, what the hedge fund guy used to say is we're back in the soup. Kind of like, well, it's just kind of like you're, you're in no man's land. You know, he called it in the soup. And it wasn't just a, between the 50 and the 200. It was when the market chopped around especially when it was in between moving averages and Gary calls it no man's land. So call it what you want. Something just hit the house. <laughs> now, if we take a look at the daily S and P and the 200 day moving average, let's see, this is going back to April. The 200 held back then, and we'll take a look at the live chart in just one second. And we we did dip below it on a daily basis recently. We'll get back to that in one second. Now, before we get into that, one thing that I often talk about is a net-net price change. And net-net, you just basically you're saying, okay, where is the market today? Okay, and then you go back in time and say, where was the market? And what's the net net difference between those two? Okay. I also recommend when you're drawing a trend line, okay, and draw a trend line through as many bars as possible. And mathematically, even though you're kind of eyeballing the highs and lows, that does equate out to linear regression. So one thing I do every now and then just for S&Gs and kind of little fun is I plot a bunch of little linear regressions on the chart, and then I walk forward and backwards with those linear regressions. And you could see, and of course, your big blue arrow is also good to draw too. I guess in this case it's red. But, but as you could see, except for the shorter term in here, coming into October, all these linear regressions, it's like a 20-day, a 40-day, an 80-day, a 100-day, and a 200-day. This would be like a 200-year. And obviously, the shorter days, just count the bars, and you'll, it'll tell you how many days. They're all pointed higher, and they're all kind of together, okay? So, you know, maybe someday I'll develop a system based on this. I guess I already have. It's called the Big Blue Arrow. Uh, to those of you who know me, I draw big blue arrows in the chart, and that's just because my paint program defaults into blue in the mid to late 90s when I first started putting commentary out there on the internet. Now, you could see, oh, there's a big blue arrow. I thought I had one in there. So you could do a lot of linear regression work, or you could just draw a big blue arrow. Now, where are we now? Okay, well, this is kind of interesting. So if you fast forward just for October, you could see that these longer-term linear regressions such as the 200 period linear regression, still headed higher, okay? And it will take a little time to catch up with the market. But notice that these somewhat intermediate term linear regressions have turned down. And again, it's not rocket science. You could draw a line from the high to the current market, okay, and get the same thing. But it's, sometimes it's kind of interesting 
to put an indicator on. Now, you know me, I'm not a big fan of indicators, so why am I talking about indicators? Well, sometimes it helps to tell you where you are because sometimes you get caught up in price action and if you have an indicator on the chart, and I keep it simple, moving averages are really the only indicator I ever use. Something like this, linear aggression, is something I just mess around with here and there. I don't build a system based on this, unlike moving averages, where I do actually have setups based on the moving average. But the point I'm making is when uh, yesterday or day before I was editing some videos from the stock selection course to put them into the new system, and one thing that I said, if you weren't sure where the trend was, plot the bow tie moving averages and see if they were in uptrend proper order or downtrend proper order, meaning that is the 10 above the 20 and 20 above the 30 or vice versa for downtrends. And then yesterday morning after doing that editing, I got an email from somebody who wanted to buy a stock, wanted to know if it was worth buying because it had pulled back. Well, it, it pulled back like this, and then that moving average had rolled over. So my point to him was, well, take a look at that bow tie moving average. And yeah, the big blue arrow might still be pointing higher, but over the short to intermediate term, it's starting to get kind of ugly. And if you didn't know anything about trend, just look at that moving average. So indicators do have their use, just don't overuse and abuse them. Now, one thing I'm often asked, about is can you use a pattern on a different time frame and yeah you just saw me use daily patterns and weekly patterns you could actually use hourly patterns with some of this stuff now keep in mind it's going to be a lot noisier than a daily and a daily is going to be a lot noisier than a weekly and so on and so forth but it's always fascinating to me when we have these big market slides i always back the chart out or roll the chart down i should say to the hourly to see what happened and it was kind of cool in the spiders, which makes a good proxy because you could actually trade them. You could see that we had a sloppy bow tie back in September from all time highs. And this is an hourly chart. And sloppy, I mean, it's like the moving average are trying to come together, trying to cross over. And you can see they just kind of meander back and forth. And then they kind of get back into the proper uptrend order. And then we have a cleaner bow tie here where the moving averages came together and spread out. It's a lot more bow tie looking. It looks like a bow tie on its side, okay? Now, notice that this is right after all-time high. Sometimes that second signal, when it just gets barely either touches those all-time highs or fails to make it to all-time highs, sometimes that second signal can be really significant. Years ago, now these were day traders, but the same thing applies. But years ago, I knew someone, and he would, well, I guess you could say his name is Kevin Haggerty. When he would hire a new day trader for his firm, he would, until the guy proved himself, okay, got his feet wet and proved himself, he would only let them take second signals. Now, they would miss, miss a lot of good trades on that first signal, but they also were a lot more accurate and more profitable. If they could be profitable taking second si signals, then as they became better and better and remained consistent in taking those second signals, he allowed them to take first signals. So that's a little fodder to throw out there for you or something you should file away. With these bow ties, you go back and look at that major top in the euro, when was that, 2008 or 2007, I forget when, you had a second mouse type of signal. I remember getting stopped out of the first one, being short the euro, and then that second says, uh, signal was probably the biggest currency trade I've ever made. It worked out really, really nicely. So rolling this down to an hourly chart, you could see on the S&Ps that second signal did set up after all-time highs. Now, I don't suggest you rush out and trade hourly signals unless, of course, you're trading something like hourly bow ties off of major, major highs and major, major lows. The only problem with trading hourly charts is that they're going to be a little bit more noisier because you're going to get a lot more signals that don't pan out to be the mother of all signals. But in some markets that are more efficient, such as Forex and indices, I will trade an hourly chart. In stocks, I stick to the daily charts because that's where the real money is.
And you can see from that hourly bow tie, we had a pretty serious sell-off. Now, I left these random thoughts in from last, or from April, I should say. If we get a death cross, remember it's the magnitude of what happens between, not the signals in and of themselves. I kind of beat the dead horse on that. But the point is, let's say a market drops 50, 60, 70%, and then it comes back to recoup all those losses over the next 10 years. You don't say, well, that signal was flat. It's kind of like the guy goes to the casino. He tells his wife, hey, babe, let's go gambling. She's like, eh, I'm kind of tired. I'm just going to go to sleep. He's like, all right, well, I'm just going to go play a few bucks. And he puts five dollars on red on roulette, and he wins, and he lets it ride. He wins 20, he wins 30, uh, you know, whatever, uh, 5, 10, 20, 40, 80, 160. Before you know it, he's up to about a half a million dollars. And so he lets it ride on red. And then black comes up and he gets wiped out. So the next morning, wife wakes up and said, hey, how the gambling goes? Eh, it was all right. I lost five bucks. <laughs> you know, it's the magnitude of what happens in between. Now, right here, I put don't join the church of what's happening now. I don't remember specifically what I was talking to. Uh, I about maybe it was because there's a lot of people that come out and say things like it's different this time. Um, there's going to be a lot of fear mongering anytime the market gets a little iffy. There's going to be a blame game. Be careful connecting the dots. When I meet people who don't know me and they find out what I do, they're like, well, is it interest rates that's causing this? It's like, ah, it could be part of the problem, but it's a little bit more complex than that. Well, and then people who are a little bit more informed, well, what about the trade wars? It's like, ah, well... Yeah, it could be it could have some effect on the market, but things are either going up, down, or sideways, and it's a little bit hard for them to grasp that you could just look at charts and that tells you the health of the market. Now I also left this in here too, because when you are actively managing a portfolio, meaning that you're using stops and not just buy and hope. I'm, I'm sorry, I meant hold, buy and hold. When the market goes up for a long, 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 long time, you're going, you're going to look like a genius, okay? I've lost a lot of clients in this last bull market. I always do because they look at the S&P 500. It's like, oh, well, we just could hold on to the S&P 500. It's like, okay, well, that doesn't always work like you think. Anyway, Joe Dottery said of Stadium Capital, active management has underperformed since the lows of 2009, but this is to be expected. Anyone who's kept pace with the market the last few years should be questioned because they likely have not made any moves that would or will protect their portfolio in the next inevitable, inevitable is a key word in this little paragraph, bear market occurs. Looks like I got a few things correct in there. But anyway, that's from investing with the trend by Greg Morris. So I thought that's a pretty good thing to say. And as I often say, I thought I could get through one presentation without, but I can't. <laughs> this was back at what I learned early in the hedge fund days. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And again, we're flat with the uh, overall, overall portfolio. Now, some of these are left over in here. Let me get to... Let me show you one thing real quick. Let's go ahead and open it up for questions. And then we'll get, what's going on here? Let me fix this. Any questions at all? And then we'll get, you can start asking about individual stocks if you, if you want. Yeah, let's see. Why is this? Here we go. Okay. Um, the members area is now live. And this is 20 years in the making and about one year of serious work on top of that. And one thing that I've done that's been really cool, and I, boy, I'm getting a lot of interesting things that are being put in. Here are my trading goals. And like I said last week, the beauty is every time I log in, I'm forced to look at this. And maybe I should reread it today because, truth be told, a little while ago, I was looking at a possible day trade, okay? Nothing wrong with day trading. If you're a day trader and that's all you do, I've got somebody recently took a trade 
and I kind of picked it apart a little bit. It's kind of like, well, it worked. It's like, eh, give me a hundred examples of when you traded that in the past. Explain to me what your pattern is. And then maybe we could debate whether or not you actually have something. So very important to obviously stick with the plan, the bigger picture plan. Okay. So the point is, every time you log in, you're going to see your trading goals right here. And it's kind of interesting, as I said in the introductory videos. By the way, if you go to, if you go, you could actually access the free section of this uh, website and see uh, a lot of this stuff in there. And one thing that, that I learned from this process was that these trading goals, I thought would all be process oriented, like, hey, I'm going to plan my trade, I'm gonna follow that plan and everything that I say, or something similar to what I've said here. But the reality was, a lot of these goals were motivational in nature, not make a million dollars in 10 minutes a day, like some of the bullshit in my inbox, but more like, hey, I want to grow my capital, so I could see my children more, so I could travel more, so I could do these other things. So that's kind of a different angle on that I never thought about. And from that angle, it's motivational because you could say, okay, if I fire off this day trade, and I'm not a day trader, am I moving toward my goal or away from my goal? So having this up every day has really been a godsend for me, and I think it'll help you out too. So the members area is live again and if you go to the trading service we're going to trading service by now you should know that it's now behind the firewall here as opposed to a secondary provider but if you go in the trading courses i'm gonna have some questions on this so let me explain to you what's going on if you go to if you go to trading courses why isn't this working oh i know because i'm in draw mode if you go to trading courses oops These are slides, not the actual website. The website works a little bit better, hopefully. Um, you can see up here we have the premium courses. These are all the things I've done before. Trading full circle, the micro course in psychology, hot IPOs, et cetera. And then here are all the member courses down here. And what's cool is as long as you stay a member or the more you stay a member, the longer you stay a member, the more courses up here you unlock. So my goal is or the idea is to unlock everything over time, whereas – 100% of all this is unlocked down here. And by the time you got through all of those courses, then the new, the advanced courses would be available up top. I don't want to talk too much about this because I've mentioned it before. But the point I was making last few weeks is that, let's see if we get a better pointer here. The point I was making last few weeks is let's say somebody has a money management issue and they email me and it's like i give them the answer but i come in this courses and i look it's like wait a minute they barely even started money management now i know where their problem is they need to finish money management to make sure they got their head wrapped around everything the other thing that amazes me and I've, and it's so funny i use the example in the intro videos to this but what amazes me is people will put their hard-earned money into the markets lose it all go make some more put it in the markets, lose it all. But they won't spend any time getting educated. And they could take a small percentage of what they're losing, get educated, and they might not get rich overnight, okay? But they certainly won't lose all their money over and over, rinse and repeat. I'm not sure why so many people do that. That just kind of baffles me. And maybe someday I'll get the answer to that question too. Because remember I had the question, the big question was why do successful people trade in mediocre stocks well psychiatrist said well let me explain to you why so that's going to be my new question why would people lose their money in the markets rinse and repeat and not bother to get educated cheaply i might add anyway so this is a member site lots of features here such as 911 calls which are pretty cool you can call me and all these a lot of these things you earn over time all those courses that i mentioned earlier or uh, will the, the members courses are free to members and then the premium courses will be unlocked over time so it's a couple thousand dollars in premium courses it's much cheaper just to be a member and then you get access to those over time anyway so consulting and some other stuff is all thrown in here 
And then I do a weekly, I'm sorry, bi-weekly right now, Q&A session. And then here are all the bonuses. And somebody was asking me, they didn't understand what I meant by this. Well, the first week you're a member, you get the first book, the second week, the second book, the third week, or the first month, I should say, the third book, and so on and so forth. Okay, enough about that. Let's hop into the charts, live charts. Any questions on anything so far? Comments, complaints, interesting anecdotes? All right, let me get this set up. Talk amongst yourselves. Don, by that second email, do you mean um, the the email, the the newsletter with I'm warming I'm yeah, I'm warming up the fog machine, or you mean an email from GoToWebinar? I need to get to the bottom of this and figure out where everybody went. Oh, crocky. So crazy. I'm a whiz with this TC until I have to do a live show. All right. Uh, let's start off, take a look at the P's. One thing that I do want to really look at is I want to take a look at these sectors and I'm going to use the major what I call the major MIGs and those are the Morningstar industry groups and yeah, bear with me I'm almost there there we go all right let's take a look Ooh, look at that getting kind of ugly in here huh let's see yeah, you can see a little ugly on that hourly chart, obviously. And we've turned back down after pulling back. So this is kind of ugly in here. I'm starting to get a little bit on the bearish side. You want to you wanna be careful not to label yourself, okay? So I'm kind of like, I'm kind of in no man's land to cross Gary. Shorter term, I'm pretty bearish. Longer term, I'm slightly bullish because everything so far still looks pretty good but it's beginning to get a little iffy in here big serious slide as you can see s&p 500 bow tie if this thing slides much further i would consider that a trigger and the bow tie again the weeklies are just beginning to turn down but not quite crossing yet okay let's take a look at the rusty russell 2000 the bow tie trigger was right here okay your bow ties here, your all-time highs here. What did I say? Bow ties off all-time highs, either on an hourly basis, a daily basis, or a weekly basis, or worth looking into. So your trigger was here, one, probably about 164 and a quarter or a half. And then you see we had a decent little slide. This is the Russell. So Russell looking a little ugly here. Russell's going to have its work cut out for it. This is a bit of a bummer because I like these smaller cap issues. So now it's got to get through this 165, 170 level and change to go back to the business of making new highs. Oops, blank chart. Now let's take a look at the NASDAQ and then what was Gary talking about, the index. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ first before I forget. NASDAQ composite, sort of a mirror image, uh, or not a mirror image, looks just like the, uh, maybe a mirror image, looks just like the P's. Uh, you can see pretty serious slide in here, okay? A little bit of a pullback, beginning to sell off out of that pullback. One thing I was thinking about before the show is, remember, when it comes to markets, it's not necessarily the interest rates or um, a tweet or what's going on in the world, the situation in Nigeria. I guess now it's a situation in audio, audio uh, <laughs> Saudi Arabia. It's everyone's reaction to all this, and more importantly, just the sentiment in general. Now, I hate to use the word sentiment because you could go out and try to measure sentiment, and I think that's an exercise in futility because markets will always top when sentiment is its highest, but sentiment's been at its highest probably for 10 years, okay? So you can't use that as a timing system in and of itself, but just know this, when markets begin to sell off, sometimes that selling begets more selling, 
and it's how everyone feels about the market. You look at some of these momentum stocks that have been halved just recently, what's changed? Not a damn thing has changed in those companies. In fact, if anything, the fundamentals have probably gotten better, but they've gotten halved. And that's because the sentiment quickly changed, the psychology of how everybody feels, okay? Everybody feels really good about stocks as long as they're going up, but when they begin to go down, people feel a little differently. Remember, people buy and sell for a variety of reasons, as Mary McClellan, the late mother of Tom McClellan, once said. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use far more sophisticated methods. I am sort of... Um, overlooking a, 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 a trust fund now. And my advice to the fund is to begin selling and, and they have done some selling so far. And this is just based on a couple of reasons. One, the market itself, and two, the nature of the trust and some other more complex things that have nothing to do with the overall market, by the way. But the point is that sentiment changes really quick. Up until now, I'm kind of like, eh, leave everything alone for now and let's see what happens. Okay, the point I'm trying to make there is remember what your actions are or what you're doing, and that could be a microcosm for what's really out there. Okay, and remember you're emotional just like everybody else. So let's put let's put like the bow ties in here and start looking at some of these. major MIGs, okay? So as you go through these major MIGs, you can see that consumer non durables, big bow tie down. Now, I know that this should be a shocker because the overall market has bow tied down. So all of these areas, and let's add in just for S&Gs, a 50 week moving average. What color should we make that? Let's make that cyan. Somebody asked me what S&Gs are. If you have a friend from England, ask him, he'll tell you. S and G's just just for fun, kind of like let's just have a little fun with this. And let's put uh let's make this one green. So you could see that in a lot of these areas, we're traded well, we're trading well below that 200 day moving average and well below the 50 day, or at least well below the 50 day moving average. You've had boat averages. You've had bow ties. Notice that in a lot of these cases, the bow tie is intersecting the 50 at a very sharp angle. And that's something that you want to pay careful attention to because it means the market could be in a lot of trouble. Take a look at drugs, sharp sell-off, sharp retrace, bow tie. Drugs look like they could be in trouble, trying to make a new leg down. Health services, sharp sell-off, retrace. Looks like they want to come tag the 200. So as you go through these sectors, and again, you want to, check back often but as you can see most of them could be in a little bit of trouble so just pay attention to what's going on if you don't know anything about markets then just say well what's the net net price change okay well transports are down six and a half percent going back to january of this year okay tarzan speak <laughs> Bad, right? Is that good or bad? Well, it's bad, right? Because it's lower than it was. Again, if you didn't know anything, where's the market now? Where was the market? That's a good idea. Let's take a look at that. We'll take a look at that too. Anyway, let me just wrap this up real quick as far as the sectors are concerned. These technology sectors starting to get whacked pretty hard in here. The semis have been a big disappointment. They've gone sideways all year and then some, and then now they've broken down in earnest and looks like they're trying to make a new leg lower now what was gary talking about the ndx i don't even plot the ndx usually all right i hear you gary gary said it went down here gary called um, and tagged the 200 survived it so far let's just see where the p's are let's go back to the p's real quick and we'll take a look at the dow yeah the p's are now getting ready to dip back below that 200 day moving average nothing magical about that but it can and can be in the keyword in that sentence helps keep you on the right side of the market and the Dow, which I don't even pay attention to, but the media gets their panties in the water of the Dow. Pretty serious sell-off in the Dow today. Not too far away from the 200-day moving average. So far, as Gary explained, it is held. All right, let's open up for individual stocks. 
Don has some interesting comments on HD and low. HD and low are getting killed with all the storm damage we've seen. Your thoughts? Well, you are trying to confuse the issue with facts, okay? So I think Don's point is that, well, shouldn't those stocks be going higher because of the storm damage? Because there's going to be a lot of rebuilding. Well, yeah, but what is, is. And that's the hardest part of trading. And Don, you know this. But that's the hardest part of trading is just accepting what is. Well, we have a bow tie. Let's take a look at this HD. So we had a bow tie trigger. Well, it didn't quite trigger. You had a first thrust. The bow tie officially triggered a couple days ago. Okay. So you got a bow tie and it's coming off all time highs. As I've been saying for the last hour, that's usually a signal that should be respected. So what do you do? Well, let me see what's going on in Florida and let me figure out what the book value is and how much money are they going to get from the, from Michael, from the damage there. And well, that might all add up to something, but that something might already be priced into the market, okay? Those fundamentals, that increase in sales from that might already be priced into the market. Well, you, okay, so you FICO, you, FICO, you factor in the Michael situation, well, let's factor in interest rates. Well, interest rates going up, we're going to have fewer homes being built maybe because it's going to be more expensive to buy a home, so maybe Home Depot might not do as well because of that. And before you know it, you end up with analysis paralysis because it's impossible to wrap your head around it. So if your point is that it's going down in spite of that, that's that works great. You're going to find your best trades will be a little counterintuitive. And not to go off on too much of a tangent, but a kind of a tangential thought on this would be a great system would be a momentum based system that uses fundamentals. Stay with me with the caveat that the fundamentals have to be poor or non existent. So it must have negative earnings, okay, <laughs> or just really, really, really crappy fundamentals. And then somebody is often when I'll say this, somebody will email Dave, you already built that system. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> point taken. A lot of these momentum stocks have that issue okay any individual stocks you guys want to take a look at today be happy to pull those up for you we're we talking about low yeah lows beginning to get hit fairly hard too we had a gap down yesterday it's a little bit uh a little bit funkier chart you had the big gap up and now it's going down but yeah it looks like it's in trouble too i agree with you on that adobe yeah, Adobe's one that I was looking at. It was on my list last night. I actually I actually took it off. Now, here's the thing. Before we pick apart any individual stocks, when you start going through stocks, if you take a look at like, like if I went down here and looked at my pullback list for last night, let me show you something real quick. We have a little time. All right, here was my pullback list last night. I got to be careful. I think a lot of times I name those things weird stuff. I'm like, nobody's ever going to see that. And here I am showing you them. <laughs> so, but if you go to this pullback list and let's sort it by like 50 day HV. And let's take a look at, let's go down to, let's go down to like where the big cap stocks would be somewhere in the thirties or forties. Okay. So if we start in the forties, on EHV, and we start going through this, what you're gonna see is a lot of these stocks are gonna look the same, okay? Thrust and then pullback, or make it easier for you. Let's just let's just take a look at bow ties. Looks like I screwed up my system here. Okay, so as you start going through these, you're gonna see that a lot of stocks are going to look the same, or a lot of stocks, I should say, that are set up are going to look the same. Okay, what was that? Bow tie down. So, you know, bow tie down, S T A A, or first thrust down. So, all the stocks that are set up, and I had probably about 50 stocks last night on my list before I started calling down, they all pretty much started looking the same. Bow ties down, followed by a pullback. And I saw that pattern over and over and over again. Adobe was one of them. Now, 
the reason I'm showing you this is because I took Adobe off my list, not because it wasn't a good looking setup so much as I just had so many other ones I had to call down. So getting back to Adobe, and let's clean the chart up. I didn't like this little gap that we had here, and that's why I eventually took it off of my list. But if you go back to the list that I had for yesterday, there were plenty of other stocks that, and I'll just I'll just grab one randomly. I don't think my people will get too mad at me. I, and I have no idea what the charts could look like. Well, that's got a tiny gap in it, but you can see a little bit cleaner than Adobe. This is CRM, sharp sell off, pull back. So this pattern is just going happening over and over and over and over and over again. And again, I had a plethora of shorts coming into today. So yeah, Don, uh, I think that's a worthwhile short. I think there's a lot of other ones out there you can compare it to that might be worth trading, but definitely can't uh, beat you up too much on that one. And yes, it was on my list coming into today, but I went ahead and called it down based on the magnitude, or I should say the number of other shorts that I had coming in, okay? All right, any more? Well, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. My apologies for not getting that. Um, we got to figure out what's going on with that link, and thanks for all your help on that. Don wants to take a look at SQ real quick, certainly. Yeah, you know, that's another one that, that's been on my list, okay? You got the first thrust down and pullback. You got a lot, a lot of stocks that look just like that. Um, keeps going back to the hour. I got to fix that. Oh, let's take a look at the hourly. What the hell? Yeah, he had an hourly bow tie back here. Let's take a look at the daily. Yeah, you know, thrust down, bow tie. That looks fantastic, you know. Uh, the only the only caveat with shorting, this is a little bit more volatile stock. It's going to be a little bit more dangerous to short, okay? So be careful in shorting something like this. Just make sure you have a chair ready. Okay, Dan wants to talk about texts and the socks. Well, if you take a look at the technology ETF, you can see that it's kind of it looks a lot like the socks, okay? And it's kind of made a major top in here so far, or at the least, you could argue that it's beginning to break down out of this range. I wouldn't short this in and of itself because there's a lot of individual tech issues that might be worth shorting. Let's take a look at the semiconductor index. Same sort of action there, recent thrust down. But the problem with the semis is they're kind of wide and loose and all over the place, okay? But they are beginning to break down. And, yes, it is a major, major top. I think some other areas in here, if we get back to those major MIGs, might be might offer some cleaner opportunities. And let's just see if we can find something. See, if you take a look at like retail, for instance, it's coming off of all time highs. It's not so wide and loose. It's pulled back, it's bow tied. That might provide a better shorting opportunity. Case in point, we just look at that Home Depot, look pretty ugly in here, beginning to break down. Take a look at, I notice health services are beginning to implode a little bit in here, looking pretty ugly. Maybe health services could offer some opportunities in the early phases of breaking down. They trade cleanly, and they've been in a longer-term momentum pattern, but now they're beginning to top out. could be dangerous. This market could be look below and fail. Got to be careful. Get your head ripped off. Maybe better to sit on your hands and wait for some direction. Yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there's nothing wrong with – sitting on your hands uh again we got stopped out of all stocks in the portfolio except for one i have one long i think left i have one lonely long and that's it and i'm in trend following mode on that but when the trend ends i have to get out and that's in my own personal accounts but the model portfolio is completely empty right now and you know i mean i, I have causes for concern about the market being lower but it's from a personal standpoint it sure is nice to come in when the futures are down 30 points ago. Hmm, that's interesting, as opposed to holy, insert your favorite explicitive.
My favorite explicative you could use is a noun, a pronoun, a verb, an object of the preposition, and so forth, and an adverb, and so on and so forth. Up issues versus down. Don't mention new highs, new lows. Don't mention. Okay. Um, yeah, I, there's a long-winded answer to all of that. And if you uh, if you are a member of DaveLandry.com in the members area, if you go to the Q&A, I go through a long-winded explanation of all that because that was asked to me just recently. And I guess I'll go and just let me just kind of re-answer it real quick. Like Greg Morris deals with more ETFs. His fund used to trade just ETFs. So he's looking for more of a bigger picture analysis. So he did a lot of advanced declines, new highs, new lows, all that type of analysis. What I do is I focus purely on price and I do a lot of empirical research. Now, it's a much longer answer that I gave in the Q&A, but I do a lot of empirical research. If I'm seeing a lot of debacle du jour, I've seen a lot of stocks that are lower. When I look at these 239, uh, what do you call these things? Uh, Morningstar Industry Groups. What do they call them now? Still Morningstar? I forget the name of them. Um, what are all these things called? It was Morningstar, then it was something else. Then it was, uh, okay, it's Morningstar again. Or it's back to Morningstar. So when I look at these 239 morning industry morning store industry groups, and I, I go through these fairly quickly, I get a pretty good feel for what's actually going on in the market, up, down, or sideways. So as you go through these, you can see, and the software won't keep up, the recording will. Most of these are headed lower. Most of these are looking pretty ugly, okay? So yeah, if you want to use new highs, new lows, advanced declines, and all that other stuff, knock yourself out. But I think you could end up with analysis paralysis, unless that's what you all you did and you needed that big picture analysis as part of your model. I think it's much easier, a little bit more work in some cases, but easier to go through a couple thousand charts every day, a couple hundred, 300 maybe sectors every day, look at maybe a handful of ETFs, and then look at a handful of indices, and that's going to give you a pretty good feel for what's going on. Pretty much everything I just showed you in this presentation. So yeah, if you want to use that, fine. Just be careful if you try to make a model out of that. And if you do make a model out of it, spend 10 years working on it and perfecting it. Market may be worried about election. Market doesn't like uncertainty. Yeah, you know, I mean, who knows? Yeah, it, it, that could be. The, the whys will always come later, okay? And they're always going to be in hindsight. And then you know, keep in mind, too, I was reading uh, the book, I think it's the Art of Cle uh, Thinking Clearly this morning, and a lot of times history gets rewritten, you know, so um, the reasons that they're telling you now are going to be different from the reasons that they're telling you in a month from now, okay? So don't worry about the why so much, just what is, is, unless you're Bill Clinton, of course. All right, any more questions? And okay, once again, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you so much for being here. I am humbled by your presence. Any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Check out the members area, it's free to get started. There's a lot of good stuff just in the free section. I'm already getting quite a few of you emailing on that to thank me, so you're welcome on that. I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. And uh, if we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a good weekend. Thank you so much.